Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India I welcome all to the 20th lecture of this course. This 20th lecture is on nano toxicology. So, this is the last lecture of this course. Okay. So, till now we have uh, learnt various biomedical applications of this uh, nanomaterials in this course, and today we are going to see the other side of nanomaterials that is toxicity of nanomaterials. So, in this lecture, we are going to learn what is nano toxicology, what are the various exposure scenarios and what are the various methodologies available to study the toxicity of nanoparticles and we are also going to learn uh, what is genotoxicity and how to study the hemocompatibility of your uh, nanomaterials okay and also how to study the uh, in vivo assessment of your nanomaterials toxicity so let us see uh, what is nanotoxicology so this nanotoxicology is a study of toxicity of nanomaterials okay and nanomaterials even when made of inert elements like gold become highly active at nanometer dimension. As you know that gold is a inert material, means we use it for making ornaments or jewels and when it goes to nano scale, it will show you a different kind of properties. Okay. So, here this nanotoxicology studies are intended to determine whether and what extent these properties may pose a threat to the environment and to the human beings. Okay. So, here this nanotechnology is a double edged sword, the same novel properties making nanoparticles attractive makes them potentially toxic too. Okay. So, the particular care must be taken in nanomedicines since in this area where greater exposure would be present. So, most of the field uh, have its own advantage as well as disadvantages. Similarly, this nanotechnology also like a double edged sword. So, it has its own advantages as well as disadvantages. So, we have to select the nanomaterials wisely for the various biomedical applications. So, why we have to study the nanotoxicology? You can see here these are the various consumer products where they are using this nanoscale materials. For example, so this L'Oreal company is using this uh, nanoparticle based cosmetics and uh, Motorola is using the CNT based uh, nano emissive displays. Okay. And also we have uh, nano care fabrics shirts and uh, carbon nanofiber rackets. Okay. And uh, also in India also we are having several uh, washing machine okay, which is coated with the silver nanoparticle and also in the nowadays in the TV advertisement we are seeing that some of the soap. Uh, they are using silver nanoparticles. Okay. So, what happens this uh, silver nanoparticles and everything, everything goes into the water bodies. Okay. So, when it goes into the water bodies, how it is going to affect the living organism in the water bodies and again it will contaminate the ground water and how it is going to cause toxicity. So, those things we do not know. Okay. So, in this lecture we try to learn what are the nanotoxicity methodologies available to study the toxicity of nanomaterials. So, this you might have seen it uh, in the cricket. Okay. So, in the Australian players mostly they used to uh, apply this kind of uh, sunscreen. Okay. So, this is a bulk form of zinc which is white and opaque okay. and uh, this side he applied the same sunscreen, but it is in the nano zinc. So, the nano zinc is transparent and this bulk zinc that is the sunscreen it is a white and opaque. Okay. So, when the uh, material goes to nano scale, the properties of the material get changed okay. and the nano gold can be red and blue and carbon nanotubes can connect electricity. So, new applications for familiar materials okay. and again, but also new risk. So, the inert material which we are using day to day, okay, when it goes to nano scale, it is going to have some different kind of properties and different kind of properties, it may have advantage at the same time, it may have new risk also. So, these are the various companies uh, involved in this uh, nano, for example, Nestle, Pepsi and uh, some of the other companies are involved in this. Okay. So, most of the companies they product the uh, product in the name of uh, trade secret or in the name of uh, patent protected laws. Okay. So, we are not aware about what are the nano materials in the food products. So, these are the other products, nano products, nano based products, okay. for example, sunscreen cosmetics and even the baby diaper and uh, baby bottle, feeding bottle. So, everything uh, they started using this nano materials and nano coatings. So, but we do not know what will be the long term effects. Okay. So, this is in uh, early 2008, approximately 104 foods uh, and food additives 
contain nanoparticles okay which is on sale on internationally and uh, some of the analyst uh, suggest that almost uh, 500 nano foods are available in the worldwide okay so almost uh, 500 nano foods are already in the market so we are not aware about what are those and there is no labeling for example if you are using the gmo food so there should be gmo label similarly uh, if you are using a nano food or nano coatings there should be some label to indicate this these are uh, coated with nano particles or this food is uh, wrapped with nano package okay so there is no such labelings and again this uh, nano uh, can play a major, a major role in agriculture also so it can make the agriculture uniform and uh, it can make further automated and industrialized okay and uh, so due to which what will happen this uh, the farmers may lose the farming knowledge but at the same time but uh, it can have the designer substance which can deliver the nutrients efficiently into the body okay and uh, these are some of the nano foods on sale include uh, cooking oils teas and also we can have the antibacterial kitchen ware okay and also food processing and uh, food packaging material so this nano based food packing materials uh, will interact with the food and it will prevent the microbial growth but uh, this nano material is also interacting with your food substance so when it interact with the food how much amount of nano particle is releasing into a food material and uh, when you take those food what will happen to you so those things are not understood thoroughly so recently a us based company nanoceuticals okay so they made a slim shake chocolate okay so this is a diet milkshake that uses silica nano particles coated in cocoa clusters to increase the taste with low cocoa and sugar content okay but uh, this health risk of nano silica remain poorly understood and uh, early studies suggest need for caution so this slim shake is uh, made up of silica nanoparticles so what is silica nanoparticles silica nanoparticles are basically a sand particles okay so in your childhood if you eat a sand your mom will beat you but the same sand particles you are drinking in the form of silica slim shake so but we don't know the what will be the long term effect of this uh, silica based uh, chocolate drinks okay and uh, these are the some of the other uh, future nano food and agriculture like uh, we can have the edible nano wrappers and coatings okay and uh, and also we can use the nano biotechnology to manipulation of seeds so we can use these technologies to manipulate the seeds to increase the growth okay and also we can increase the uh, productivity but again what will be the drawback and uh, long term effects still unknown and again this nanotechnology could enable junk food to be fat free sugar free and also uh, it can reduce the carbohydrate and it can increase the vitamin and protein and it can be fiber enhanced okay so then it can be marketed as healthy alternative so this junk food can be enriched with protein and fiber and uh, it can be sold in the name of like a healthy alternative but the problem is uh, our uh, relationship with the real food will be eroded and again this nano could displace the workers and erode the farming knowledge because everything will be automated so automated nano surveillance and management systems okay so that could reduce the need for farm workers and uh, this nano could commodify farming knowledge and uh, the nano will play a major role and it will take up the technology like a proprietary technologies okay so only the some of the multinational companies they can control the food and agriculture so so let us see some of the examples of how these nano particles pose some new toxic risk so here the nano materials are readily inhaled and ingested and at least some will cross the skin and uh, nano materials gain access to tissues and cells than the larger particles okay and uh, inhaled nano particles can also cross the blood brain barrier okay so that is the important property of this nano particles so most of the other drugs cannot enter the blood brain barrier but this nano particles it can cross the blood brain barrier so let us see some more examples so this nano silver is toxic to rodent liver brain and stem cells and may harm beneficial bacteria also and this nano zinc oxide is toxic to rat and human cells even at low doses and nano silicon dioxide less than 70 nanometer can cause onset pathology similar to your neurodegenerative disorders and this nano titan dioxide can damage dna in human cells harm algae and water fleas and uh, especially with help of u light exposure so this uh, titanium dioxide is everywhere in your from your toothpaste and your talcum powder and everywhere this titanium dioxide is there and uh, this nano titanium dioxide when it uh, go into the water bodies and it is a very good photocatalyst in presence of sunlight so it will act like a 
very good photo catalyst. So, it can harm the algae and the other uh, uh, living organism in the water bodies. So, here this nanoparticles can desert our immune system response and uh, here nanoparticles can also act like a Trojan horse and uh, the Trojan horse means like this nanoparticles will be in your body for uh, more time. So, it can it has more circulation time and uh, suddenly it may cause some new toxic effects. So, that effect is called as Trojan horse effect and uh, this possible link between the consumption of processed foods and uh, irritable bowel and uh, Crohn's disease. So, these nanomaterials can also induce this kind of diseases. Okay. So, the UK Royal Society recommended in 2004, uh, they made these are the some of the rules for the nano safety. So, that is a full safety assessment of all products that contain nano prior to market release and all nano ingredients to be labeled and uh, environmental release of nanomaterials to be avoided as far as possible and factories and research laboratories to treat nanomaterials as if they were hazardous. So, let us see these uh, uh, properties of nanoscale materials. The same properties making nanomaterials so interesting can make them potentially harmful as I told you earlier. So, this enhanced reactivity and increased surface area to mass ratio and enhanced permeation okay, and also previously unknown forms of common materials. So, these are the properties uh, which has a wide application biomedical field and also the same properties will also have some toxic effects. Okay. So, let us see what are the various exposure scenarios. So, all substances in the world are toxic to plants, animals and the humans at some exposure levels. So, there are two routes, short term routes and long term routes. So, in the short term routes, it is mainly due to inhalation gas phase and uh, skin contact in solution and also oral ingestion and in the long term routes, mainly due to the soil adsorption and uh, water dissolution and also biodegradation issues. So, the risk evolution for exposure to uh, nanotechnology product is hindered by the law protected secrecy of product formulation and also there is a lack of uh, specific regulations on nanotechnology and uh, non mandatory reports on toxicity of products okay. and we are still using the old criteria and uh, methods became absolute and here these researchers from uh, National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. So, determines the concentration of nanoparticles in the air while unloading a reactor for producing the metal oxide nanoparticles and uh, these are the various uh, international initiatives. Okay. So, recently some agencies have taken some actions to establish uh, regulations to nanotechnology. So, international standard organization and uh, US national nanotechnology initiative and uh, British standard Initi institute okay. and also the environmental protection agency. Okay. So, all these agencies have published reports and guidelines related to the handling of nanomaterials and the uh, research approach to nanotoxicology. So, but uh, all of them are uh, voluntary to follow, there is no mandatory rules and regulation. So, let us see the methodologies for studying the toxicity of nanoparticles. So, if you see this is your uh, carbon nanotubes, 100 grams of carbon nanotubes, but it look like a 100 kg. Okay. So, there are several points uh, we have to understand to uh, study the uh, toxicity of the nanomaterials. So, what to measure like uh, how much duration and what is the route of exposure and what is the dosage and formulation of test material okay. and also what kind of biological species you are going to use to study the toxicity of nanomaterials and uh, whether do you have uh, standard references and the standard materials for uh, comparisons. So, these are the questions uh, to be considered before we start the nanotoxicology studies and, uh, and also the main important thing is how to design a realistic test. Okay. So, the meaningful results on the toxicity of nanomaterials are achieved when the conditions of possible exposure are reproduced accurately. So, let us see how the nanoparticles would enter the body. The first one is accidentally. So, it may be due to environmental contamination and uh, workplace exposure. The next one is uh, deliberately introduced that is your uh, nanomedicine applications. So, different methods of exposure of the nanoparticle might produce different results. So, let us see this with uh, some examples. So, the example one is uh, uh, installation of uh, CNT in the rats. So, here the rats that were instilled with high doses of single war carbon nanotubes, it is died due to respiratory blockage rather than pulmonary intoxication. So, here they used uh, four kind of particles including single wall carbon nanotubes. By a pressurized intraarticular installation, the CNT was given to this uh, rats okay. and it was observed at 24 hours, 1 week, 1 month and 3 months and here the results are like uh, there is inflammation, but no cytotoxicity and uh, this picture is showing that uh, the respiratory airways are mechanically blocked by carbon nanotubes due to which the rat was died. Okay. 
And the next example is uh, inhalation of carbon nanotubes in rats. So, exposing the rats to air contaminated with this carbon nanotubes led to the immune suppression. Okay. So, in the previous example, we have seen that when you uh, inject this carbon nanotubes through intratracheal administration, what happens is that most rat is died. Okay. So, in this case, so we are passing this air contaminated with low concentration of carbon nanotubes and uh, exposure of 6 hours per day during 14 days okay. and uh, the tracking of proteins and immune response in the rats. So, here the researchers observed that a signal like uh, TGF beta is released when the carbon nanotube is inhaled. So, this was tested by isolating the uh, branchial alveolar lavage fluid protein from both exposed and controlled rats and it was shown that the protein from exposed mice cause immune suppression. Okay. So, here there is uh, no death of rat and here only the immune suppression. So, from this example you can understand. So, based on the uh, method by you are giving the carbon nanotubes dosage to these animals, the results also varied. Okay. So, when you uh, instill these carbon nanotubes, the rats are died. So, when the carbon nanotubes are inhaled by the rats, only the uh, immune suppression happened. So, what are the various uh, test assessments? The methodology used led to different conclusion on the toxicity of carbon nanotubes. Okay. So, several criteria must be used to select the meaningful results like uh, what test simulates a more uh, realistic exposure and also are these results applicable to all nanotubes or exposure concentration realistic and do animal subjects respond similar to humans. Okay. So, this reliable data to answer these questions can make difference between deeming these carbon nanotubes unsafe or safe. So, what are the various methods available like uh, we can use this in vitro methods. So, in vitro methods means you can uh, do it in the laboratory condition using the bacteria or cell lines to understand the toxicity and uh, in vivo means inside the living system like living animal models like uh, mouse or the zebra fish or some other animal models and ex vivo is a combination of in vitro and ex vivo. So, we can study the toxicity of nanomaterials using the uh, bacteria and the cell culture system in vitro. Okay. And we can also study the toxicity of nanomaterials using the animal models like a mouse or rat or zebra fish. Okay. So, that is your uh, in vivo. So, that means uh, in the living system. So, this ex vivo is the combination of in vitro and in vivo. Okay. So, we can take out the particular organ and we can uh, grow in the lab and we can study the toxicity of nanomaterials. So, here the advantages are like it is cost effective, time effective and no ethical issues when you use the in vitro conditions. And uh, several studies conclude that uh, response to nanoparticles is too diverse. For instance, dogs and pigs have a higher immune response to nanoparticles. Okay. And again, this nanoparticles toxicity uh, will differ depends on the formulation. So, depends on what kind of nanoparticle you are using, what was the concentration and also what is the pH and uh, what are the coatings of the nanomaterials and also what are the exposure mode, exposure time and which is the targeted organ. Okay. And what kind of animal model you are using? Where are you going to use a rat or human cell lines or a, a fish model? Which model you are going to use? And what are the methods you are going to incorporate to understand toxicity? For example, in vitro or in vivo or ex vivo methods. So it depends on these four parameters. Okay, formulation, test, and subjacent methods. So your nanoparticle toxicity will also vary. And we can also improve the uh, in vitro techniques by substituting the 2D with uh, Three-dimensional uh, scaffold. Okay, so here this uh, this pores are the white circles. Okay, so these are created in a hydrogel matrix, and this is uh, the liver cells are like a grey color circles. Okay, so the liver can be useful to study the toxicity of uh, nanomaterials, and in a three-dimensional scaffold. So here the advantages are like uh, it will represent the complex cell-cell and cell matrix interaction, and also. So, with the help of uh, tissue engineering, we can develop this uh, artificial uh, liver and uh, we can easily understand the toxicity of nano materials. So, in this, uh, the researchers have studied the toxicity of quantum darts using this uh, three dimensional as well as uh, two dimensional scaffold. So, and they concluded that uh, the three dimensional scaffold it is exactly mimicking the uh, in vivo condition. Okay. So, you can see here this red colors are uh, dead cells. So, as I had explained in a previous lecture, so these red cells are dead cells in the 2D with the same concentration you are seeing more amount of dead cells and in the 3D culture you are seeing only few cells are dead cells, okay. but the concentration nanoparticle is same. Okay. So, when you use this 3 dimensional scaffold and that will exactly mimic like your in vivo condition. 
And other alternatives like uh, we can also do these uh, uh, modeling and simulation, the toxicity of nanoparticles depends on its physical and chemical interaction with the gases, liquids and other nanoparticles surrounding them. So this can be studied using these molecular simulations. So the specific and the quantitative knowledge obtained from theory and simulation can help building the predictive models and algorithm for assessing the likelihood of toxicity in various natural environments. So, if we know the toxicity of uh, nanomaterials, so we can do the modeling and simulation and we can uh, accelerate this nanotoxicity field, okay. So, let us see what is uh, genotoxicity. So, genotoxicity refers to the ability of a test agent to induce DNA damage, okay. So, the cytotoxicity means if it causes toxic to the cells, okay, and genotoxicity is if it damage your genetic material, okay. So, here uh, the genotoxicity assays like a uh, which can detect, quantify and uh, characterize the DNA damage induced by the substance under investigation. And uh, these methods are indicators for uh, likely carcinogenic agents and the genotoxin means a substance that damage the DNA is called as genotoxin. So, here this nano material release uh, free metal ions, so that will induce the oxidative stress and this oxidative stress will damage your DNA and it will induce the apoptosis or it will induce the inflammation okay so we have to understand whether this nanometer is inducing any damage to dna or not so you can see here when you expose the cells to these nanomaterials what happens is like uh, there may be chances for uh, chromosomal aberration so if it is a normal chromosome there is no toxic effect and uh, if there is if you are identifying that there is a chromosomal aberration that means it's due to this it can leads to abnormal cell growth and it may be the compound may be timorogenic and uh, we can also understand the genotoxicity by studying the DNA double strand breakage okay, and by using this various nucleus stain and uh, cell division and proliferation. So these are the various uh, toxic methods available. Okay. So we can use this uh, salmonella typimurium to understand whether the, this nanomaterial is inducing any mutation in your uh, genetic material okay so that is assay is called as ams assay okay and also we can use it uh, cell lines mammalian cell lines to understand uh, whether it is inducing a uh, dna laddering and uh, we can also understand uh, the apoptosis and everything so using this mtt assay and other uh, apoptotic genes okay so this i already explained in the previous lecture so let us see what is the ams test okay so here we can use a bacteria called uh, salmonella okay and which record histidine for its growth and uh, to this we can add the possible mutagen in this case we are using the nanoparticles so this bacteria will be grown in the media with the minimal histidine okay and uh, in presence of this uh, possible mutagen if it causes a mutation it will cause this histidine negative to histidine positive okay so this bacteria will grow more on this plate so if the bacteria growing more on this plate that means the nanoparticle may induce some mutation in the genetic material so you can see here when compared to the control plate where only few colonies were there okay so let us see uh, what is hemocompatibility assay so because the hemocompatibility is very important factor to decide the application of implantable biomaterials such as artificial blood vessels and orthopedic implants and with the development of uh, blood contacting materials or implantable devices it is uh, necessary to improve the hemocompatibility by surface modification or redesign so whenever you make nanomaterials or nanoparticle based coatings so we have to understand whether it is compatible with the human system and also we have to understand whether it is compatible with the blood okay so by using this hemocompatibility assay we can understand the uh, compatibility of your material with the blood so the hemocompatibility test of nanometers contain the following assays so it is a hemolytic assay or anticoagulant assay and uh, platelet addition and activation assay blood coagulation time assay and blood protein adsorption assay so how to collect the blood uh, we can take the blood from human okay you can take a 2 ml of blood okay or you can collect the blood from the goat also but in case of human when you collect uh, your own blood also so you have to take the ethical committee permission human ethical committee permission so it is easy to take the blood from the goat so you can collect the blood from the nearby slaughterhouse and you can use it for hemocompatibility studies so here when you collect the blood, uh, you have to mix the blood immediately with the tripotassium EDTA that is your anticoagulant. Okay. So this blood can be, the goat blood can be collected from the slaughterhouse and uh, in presence of anticoagulant. Okay. 
So then you can centrifuge it at uh, 13,000 RPM for 10 minutes at 4 degrees Celsius. So when you centrifuge, uh, you'll get this kind of layers, and you can use this isolated uh, platelet-rich plasma, that is PRP, for your further studies. And uh, here, this is your uh, polymer flame, and uh, you want to understand whether this polymer flame is uh, hemocompatible or not. Okay, so you can cut into circular disc using this. Uh, even a simple punch machine, okay, sterile punch machine. So, it can cut a uniform size and uh, this can be sterilized by keeping it under the UV light for 30 minutes and this disc can be transferred to the 96 well plate, okay, and washed with PBS. So, then you can uh, add the isolated platelets on the polymer circular disc. So, you can add a 200 microliter of PRP in each well and you can incubate in the incubator for uh, 30 minutes at 37 degrees Celsius, okay. And uh, you can observe the adhered and activated plate layers on the polymer disc surface using the microscope. And uh, you can wash this three times with the PBS to remove the non adhered platelets. Okay. So, when you view under the microscope, you will get uh, this kind of results. If you are getting this kind of result, that means uh, less adherence of platelets okay. and there is no change in the shape. That means there is no release of coagulation factor and it is a good material for implant. So, under the microscope, if you are seeing uh, this kind of shapes, that means more adherence and the change in the shape. So, it is mainly due to the activated platelets, it is losing more coagulation factor and it is not good material for implant. Okay. So, next one is uh, in vivo assessment of nanomaterial toxicity. So, why we have to use zebra fish as a human model? Because it is a small vertebrate tropical water fish. Okay. So, it has a clear and transparent embryos with a short maturation time and a functionally homologue with a almost 70 percent of human disease genes and forward and reverse genetic model system is possible here and we can also do the chemical biology and chemical genetic studies using zebra fish. So, let us see some of the examples how we can study the toxicity of selenium particles using these zebra fish embryos. Okay. So, here they in this paper uh, they have used uh, two different kind of uh, nanoparticles. Okay. One is uh, starch coated cellular nanoparticles, one is BSA coated cellular nanoparticles. And, uh, we can study the toxicity of the nanomaterials in term of uh, mortality rate of zebra fish or hatching as well as the heart rate and abnormal phenotypes. Okay. So, this is a zebra fish heart beating. Okay. So, we can measure the heart rate also compared to the control what is the heart rate in the treated zebra fish embryos. So, here you can see here, so they have used that zebra fish embryo and treated with a different concentration of silver nanoparticle. So, this is our normal embryo and this is a malformed embryo and these are the dead embryo in presence of silver nanoparticle. So, based on that you can count the number of uh, embryos which got the malformed embryo as well as the dead embryo and based on that you can calculate the uh, toxicity of nano materials. And in this case uh, they have observed that uh, the silver nanoparticle is in the most of the mitochondria as well as the nucleus. That means it is possible that the nanoparticles enter the cells through many routes, among them endocytosis through the embryo wall is more likely okay. and it is entering the mitochondria as well as the nucleus and it may induce some damage to your DNA also. So, by elemental analysis of embryo, they have observed that uh, cellular nanoparticle is more in the nucleus. So, they believe that it may create a cascade of toxic events which may lead to damage the DNA okay, and uh, which will lead to various uh, toxic effect. Zebra fish embryos with a different concentration of cellular nanoparticles. So, you can see here this uh, heart rate is going down and again this uh, mortality rate is increasing. Okay. So, this nanoparticle deposition in the central nervous system could have adverse effects in the control of cardiac rhythm, respiration and body movements. So, you can see here this heart rate is going down with respect to concentration and again this exposure to cellular nanoparticles uh, resulted in the accumulation of blood causing edema and necrosis. So, that is why this mortality rate is increasing. And we can also use that uh, mouse or rat model for studying the toxicity of nanoparticles. So, organization for economic cooperation and uh, development guidelines recommend oral toxic test and dermal toxic test to understand the toxicity of nanomaterials. So, for the oral toxic test, uh, collided nanomaterials at the limited dose of 5000 uh, milligram per kilogram body weight could be given to the mouse okay. and uh, it can be observed for toxic symptoms for the first 3 hours 
and after 24 hours. So, these animals could be maintained and uh, observed daily over 14 days for the skin and also behavioral symptoms and toxic sign. And then we can do the hematological and the biochemical testing. So, these animals will be sacrificed after 14 days and uh, histopathological testing could be made for understanding how much is uh, nanoparticle deposited in the kidney, spleen and liver. So, the next one is the dermal toxic test. Okay. So, we can apply these uh, nanomaterials on the surface of the animal models. Okay. So, the group 1 is treated with the distilled water and the group 2 receives 50 ppm of colloidal nanoparticle solution and group 3 we can use the 100 ppm of colloidal nanoparticle solution. So, we can increase the concentration depends on the study. So, when you treat with these uh, different kind of nanoparticles, then you can study the hematological and biochemical analysis and also the histopathological investigations to understand the toxicity of nanomaterials. Okay. As a summary of this lecture, in this lecture we have learned uh, what is nanotoxicology and what are the various exposure uh, scenarios and also we have learned uh, what are the various methodologies available to study the toxicity of nanoparticles and we have also learned uh, what is genotoxicity and also how to study the hemocompatibility of your uh, nanomaterials and uh, in vivo assessment for studying the nanomaterials toxicity. So, I will end my lecture here. I thank you all for listening to this lecture and all the best for your exams.